Listen, I appreciate you uh, giving me your time today. It's it's much appreciated. Uh, it's just been sorry for the mix-ups. It's just been kind of busy here, and I had to go through some different stuff. So we're here now. Yeah, no, I mean that's fine. No, I mean it, it all happens. And I know that doesn't say it. I really appreciate it. Uh, no worries, bro. Um, obviously, before we get into your like the the MMA and the wrestling side of things. Obviously, nowadays you have moved into a whole different different aspect of life, and I mean, looking on your website, um, and for those listening, obviously, Ken, it's kenshamrock.com, um, that you've obviously you're doing motivational work, and especially, and also you're doing a lot of work with, with young people and so on. How did you uh, segue into doing that, coming from the athletic career that you had? Well, uh, I, I came from that world. Um, I was a young boy um, at 10 years old. Uh, I went through a lot of, lot of troubles as a young kid. I uh, didn't have much of an upbringing. Grew up on the streets pretty much. And ended up at juvenile hall at 10 years old for strong arm robbery. And I got stabbed, gunned with the wrong people. And spent most of my teen life and young, young uh, child life uh, in the ward of the court. And I ended up in group homes and work camps and stuff like that. Yeah. So I have a little bit of history with that. So when I had people like my dad, Bob Shamrock, who owned the group home and he adopted me and showed me the right way to do things, along with my mom, Dee Dee, um, showed me, which was my adopted mother, Dee Dee, yeah. who it showed me the right way to do things. And so now it's uh, I've, I've been successful and had opportunities to take my anger out on something positive and uh, be successful. And so I feel that, you know, the opportunities that were presented to me and given to me and I was helped through these things because people uh, helped me do that. And I felt like it was my opportunity to turn around and do the same thing. I mean, do you think, obviously, with, with, with those sorts of things and with, like the Lansdowne Ministry stuff and so on, do you think that obviously your name and as you say the, the success that you had helped to open the doors for you to be able to, to speak to like troubled kids and so on? Well it definitely gives me a platform uh, for especially young children uh, who obviously will watch the stuff and say wow that's cool um, it does give open doors for me and give me a platform to be able to speak to some of these kids and they'll listen um, whether they you know take it to heart and actually apply it in life well that's I can plant the seed and oh, I yeah. can give hope oh, them that are trying to help them at wherever they're at that's got to be able to water them and and, and nourish them and, and, and teach them the right way to do things um, but I definitely I want to make sure that I can at least have the opportunity to show them that there is a way and that there is hope yeah um, I mean, you you mentioned your like the, the the tough background or the hard background that you had growing up, but yet obviously at school and college you you excelled at sports. Do you think this is almost like a release or a distraction for you from from how things were for you to to, to do that? Well, it, it really worked for me because I was a very angry kid. A lot of bad things happened to me at a very young age, um, so I was angry. And I took it out um, physically on other people. And so when I was taught how to, to channel that anger into something positive, which was football, wrestling, you know, whatever sport it was, eventually, you know, becoming a fighter, uh, it, I was able to channel that into positive directions. Without those things, they're channeled in the wrong direction and then you know, of course I'm in trouble all the time yeah. but the same thing goes for people that are more intellectual or more visual uh, or more hands on with art um, or music there's so many different ways that people vent their frustration and anger uh, depending on their personality mine happen to be very outward and very physical where there are some kids it's more inward where it's more uh, through the voice uh, or, or, or through their minds of art, um, you know, or through drama, acting things out. Uh, so there's so many different ways that you can teach children who are very angry uh, and have every right to be angry, but they just need people to show them the right way 
to vent that frustration and anger into stuff that's positive. Now, um, just out of interest, because it's one thing I've never read or seen, um, obviously, so you did the sports and, and the wrestling and so on at college, but were you, uh, or had you been a pro wrestling fan before you got involved and trained uh, for that? Uh, well, you know, I mean, obviously I watched it. My dad watched it, and so I watched a little bit of it. But uh, my recollection, the very first, I think, wrestling thing I ever saw, which was uh, always kind of stuck in my mind, was Pat Patterson and Moondog Maine. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, they, they were going at each other pretty good. I was a young kid, so to me it was it was pretty pretty big and pretty uh, exciting uh, to watch that. So... Um, yeah, so I, I, I did take a kind of a liking to it, but as I got older, um, you know, I lost interest in pro wrestling and it moved more towards football. I wanted to be a professional uh, football, I wanted to be in the NFL. Um, you know, I had a lot of these big dreams as I was growing up as a kid in and out of placements and, you know, really never having an education because I was going from placement to placement, but I had dreams. And uh, those dreams were just in my head because I want, wasn't able to really act them out consistently in a school, whether it was a, a kindergarten or whether it was preschool or whether it was grade school. I didn't stay in one place long enough to be able to kind of act out and fulfill my dreams, you know. So it wasn't until I was a, probably a freshman in high school that I settled down into a home and I was there for any amount of time to really live out my dream and really make a challenge to actually go and become what I wanted to be. Now, in the in the early nineties, obviously you, you moved from wrestling um, and you into MMA, where you were involved with Pancras and and obviously then UFC. How did that move come about? How did you how did you get involved in, in the MMA world? Well, my involvement with that was I was actually doing pro wrestling in Mooresville, North Carolina with um, Nelson Royal and Gene Anderson. They had a pro wrestling school up in Mooresville, North Carolina, and we went up there. My first experience was with Bud, Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer in Sacramento, and he ended up um, you know, getting killed. So yeah. uh, I went on to um, Mooresville, North Carolina and found those guys, and they were teaching a school out there. I jumped in on that and very quickly became... Uh, their their heavyweight champion like in six seven eight months I was a world champion and then I was going over to Japan and doing uh, now Baba's group um, you know within a year of me being a pro wrestler so I picked up things very fast and if you look at my career almost everything I've ever done whether it was the UFC or whether it was Pancras whether it was pro wrestling or whether it was a tough man contest I always became the world champ yeah right Obviously, in those uh, early days, you were in, in you know, MMA. You were known for your rivalry with Dan Severn and, then, and the Gracies and so on. But how would, how would you compare the UFC of then with the commercial juggernaut UFC that we have now? Did wow, UFC then and UFC now. Uh, <laughs> what's the difference on that? It's it was uh, it was raw. Yeah. I mean, it was really raw. You had guys that were truly from different disciplines. You didn't have the mixed martial artists that you have today. We had no holds barred in A B. Um, and it was guys coming from their disciplines, strictly their disciplines, and they went and fought each other in their disciplines. And uh, so to me, it was, it was definitely, no, it was no holds barred. No rules, no time limit. You fought four, three to four times in one night, bare knuckle. Um, so it was intense, um, just to say the least, because you didn't even know you were going to fight next. You didn't yeah. know anything about them. Um, so it was definitely the Wild West. Compared to today, where it's all technical, you know everybody, they got records, you know how to pull up and train for them. Um, you know, obviously the skill levels are, are much, much higher than what we had, yeah. um, you know, because you have all the techniques and everything to train with now. Back in them days, there was only two people, really, that had the skill level uh, to be able to do a professional training camp, and that was myself and Hoist Gracie. No. And I ate the stuff up, though. I had to make the stuff up as I went, because there's really nowhere to train. Gracie's basically did, you know, jiu-jitsu, which was grappling. They yeah. didn't strike 
took guys down. So I really developed the stand-up style and the, the grappling style, which I was doing in Japan, the Muay Thai, along with the grappling. Um, and I mixed the two together, and that's, that's when I brought it into actually the Pankers organization first. And then when, when the UFC came out, I brought the, the my mixed martial arts uh, discipline into the UFC, which if you look back on it, I was the very first mixed martial artist. I mean, you obviously at this point, or by this point in the mid nineties, whatever you had, you had set up the Lions Den gym and so on. Was was training guys and, and helping guys to develop always something that you had a passion for and you wanted to do? I did, and uh, the way that set up was I was training over in Japan, and with what we talked about a little bit earlier, yeah. was I was trying to find you know places to train. And, you know, you just there's just nowhere to do that. Um, where you could strike, punch, kick, knee, uh, you know, suplex people, get them on the ground and then work submissions along with some strikes. And it's just nowhere to train for that. So I had to bring different guys in, kickboxers and wrestlers and boxers, and basically train with them in their discipline. Um, you know, I'd wrestle with a wrestler, but I would work with submissions. Uh, and I would stand up and I would train with stand-up guys, and I would strike them and I would work the clinch and takedowns. Um, so I had to I had to I had to train while I was here because there's nowhere here in the United States to really train this this technique. So yeah. I developed a gym and I picked what I thought would be a dominant character, which was the lion, king of the jungle. And uh, I ended up bringing guys in and I started putting together training caps for guys to come in and see if they wanted to be a part of what I was doing, be a part of the club. And they had to go through a series of, of, of exercises and, and fighting in order to pass and become a part of the Lions Den. And once they were in, then I started to develop their styles um, from stand up to ground to clinch um, to all the things you needed to be a mixed martial artist. And within a year, um, I had guys that I could actually train with and be able to get prepared for fights in my own gym. So, with that being said, um, the Lions Den. Uh, on, on because I was looking for guys to train with and I needed people to work with, I ended up developing fighters, guys that became very good uh, and helped me train and also became the first mixed martial artist gym in the world. Right. In 97, obviously you uh, made the move back to pro wrestling and you rejoined uh, the WWE. How did you find the transition back to like, I'm not saying pure entertainment, because I, I know that's not, but just how did you find the move back from the MMA back to the pro wrestling world? Well, because I had some experience early on uh, when I was down with Nelson Royal and Gene Anderson yeah. in North Carolina, um, I needed to do. The difference is this time was that um, I truly understood what I needed to do. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I cut off for a second, but yeah. Yeah, it was like I knew what to do. I was already in front of uh, big crowds before. I'd been in Japan already in front of a big crowd, and I knew how to how to entertain people. And I went into into the Pankers organization, and I also took that same kind of character that, that was my personality, developed a bit in the UFC, and then as I became very popular in the UFC and became the world champion. I had an opportunity to make a move because the organization couldn't pay me enough money to support my family. And yeah. I talked with the owner at the time, Bob Meyerwitz, and he basically gave me his blessing and said, yeah, you got to do what you got to do for your family. And then I made the move to the WWF and basically took my character with me. And I took this, my submissions with me and I developed the, the uh, arm bars and the chokes and the ankle locks and the knee bars and all the things that I wanted to do pro wrestling from mixed martial arts or no holes barred into the world of pro wrestling. And now today you look at the pro wrestling and it is filtered. It is completely changed yeah, from yeah. the time I entered pro wrestling to the time that I left or before I was there. Now you see all these submission holds that are in there all over the place. So I like to think that I made a difference. I mean, when you were there, obviously you 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 had been Intercontinental Champion and, and Tag Champion and, and you won King of the Ring and so on. 
and there were there were a few times I know when the fans thought that obviously you were on the cusp of winning the heavyweight title. Was there ever any genuine talk of that, or or was it just maybe a hope that you had? Well, I know Bret Hart had talked to me about it a few times, and he had the belt at the time, and he was going to um, drop it to me. Yeah. Um, and we, he had made mention, and I guess he had discussions about, you know, because uh, The Rock was going to move up, and I was going to move up, and I thought that I was going to move up and, you know, challenge for the belt, but The Rock went ahead of me, which was fine, you know, he, he was a great worker. And so he went up, and I thought, okay, cool, no problem. Um, I'll work my way up, and I would get a shot myself because, you know, I traveled that same path. Yeah. Uh, but he ended up jumping in front of me, which was fine. I had no problem with that. Um, and got the shot at the title, ended up capturing it, and I just figured that I would be right behind him, considering that at those times our matches that we had was really a main event material, and we were the main event a few times. And so I really believed that that opportunity would come, but it never did. And as we all know, there's always politics and everything that we <laughs> And I just have no idea why those, why that decision was made. Uh, I mean, like you were obviously you've been involved. You were involved in in many memorable things. You had the the Lions Day match with with Owen at SummerSlam, and you've been part of the corporation. And you had runs, as you were saying, with or like against Foley and The Rock and Davy Boy and Sean and many others. What was what do you think, uh, or what was your favorite? memory or your the memory that stands out the most for you with of with your time there well you know I, I, I think a lot of memories for me were the, just the opportunities for me to get in there with guys like you know the undertaker and, and Shawn michaels yeah. and stone cold brett hart you know owen hart i mean i i i don't think there was a, a superstar that i did not get a chance to work with and yeah then, you know that that right there is a blessing um i was there a short time and I moved up quick, and I was in a lot of big matches, a lot of, I believe, um, history-changing matches, the one with Bret Hart, Stone Cold Steve Austin, yeah. I believe, pro yeah. wrestling. I was a big part of helping do that because of my persona and where I came from in the match that Stone Cold and Bret Hart put on. Um, it, it just was a tremendous. Then being able to capture the Rookie of the Year, King of the Ring, Intercontinental title, Tag Team title, just, uh, you know, just in a, within a two-year period. Um, so I was on fire and just blazing through, and uh, it uh, it uh, started turning and going the other direction real quick. So I don't know if it had to do with my affiliation with Bret Hart um, yeah. and Owen Hart or, or or what I don't know, but I think it's only fair that a guy pays respect to a guy who took him into his house, uh, trained him, prepared him to go into pro wrestling and, yeah. and go with this big Van Vader. He allowed me into his home, allowed me into his family, and allowed me to be a part of his family. For me not to be able to support him and then get uh, punished for it um, later on, uh, to me, you know, w where does it end? Yeah. Um, now, obviously, just, just before we, we leave the wrestling side of things altogether, you were the first TNA heavyweight champion. How did... How did you come to sign for them? Was it through Jeff or, or your friendship there, or was it, was it just a natural thing? Well, um, yeah, Jeff Jarrett, I remember they, they kind of broke off, and they, him and his dad were going to uh, put together a, 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 a program. Yeah. And so when they did that, I was like, all right, well, cool. You know, it's a, you know God bless him, and I, and I wish him the best. And uh, they went out, and they did it, and they started getting some traction. And at the time, I was in the middle of fighting still. Uh, and so they asked me to come in and do some spots uh, in Nashville on, on the TNA show. And I said, I would love to. Anything I can do to help you out, I would love to. And at the time, I had the name, you know, in the MMA. I went back into it. And so I went ahead and went out there, and I had a few matches. And, and, and Jeff's dad came to me and said that, you know, uh, we're going to put the strap on you. And, um, we're going to give you that shot. So I remember having the match, and, and I ended up winning that, and I became that, that champion. And at the time, I really didn't realize that the history of TNA, um, and that, that I was the first champion because the organization, the name and everything, it yeah. changed. It was new. Uh, so 
I was pretty uh, blessed to be there and to have that opportunity to carry that strap for the first time. And, you know, this is what I talk about, just the opportunities that I've been given through hard work, faith, and never given up. Um, you know, I came from a kid with really nothing, uh, lived on the street, to becoming the first ever champion over in Pancras, first ever over in Japan, mixed martial arts champion. The first UFC single fight, super fight champion. The first TNA champion. You know, the list goes on. Yeah. And it's, the opportunities were definitely there. I seized them. I took advantage of them. So, again, I just feel blessed that I had those opportunities. Right. You returned, obviously, to, to UFC uh, after that. And you had a, a well-renowned rivalry with Tito, amongst others. But... In 2003, you were inducted into the, the UFC Hall of Fame. How proud a moment was that for you to be just reflected and respected in that way? Well, you know, you work your whole life to like, get to a certain level. And then when you achieve that in several different areas, you know, I never really took time to look and see the things that I had done. But that's the moment where you really get an opportunity to look back and see your accomplishments play out right in front of you because they're going to honor you by giving you, you know, uh, a trophy and, and, and show your history and, and the things that you did. Other than that, you really didn't have an opportunity to look back. So it was a special moment to be able to take that time and really soak in and understand what it was that I did for mixed martial arts and yeah. no holds barred and what I meant to mixed martial arts and no holds barred. It was a good feeling. Right. These days, obviously just uh, just as we head towards the last uh, question or two, uh, these days we have Brock Lesnar who is acknowledged as, as a two sports star obviously in, in UFC and mixed martial arts and then uh, WWE. But obviously, you had blazed that way before him uh, in the 90s. How do you think, that, or how would you like to be remembered in both the MMA and the pro wrestling world? Well, uh, you know, in the whole scheme of things, when people look at you, you know, obviously you want to be recognized for your accomplishments. But I think most of all, I think you, you want people to recognize you for a human being, a person. Yeah. Uh, and somebody that was good to the people um, and was a good guy. I, I obviously fighting and doing all those things and the accomplishments are you know you do them I and mean, you want to be recognized for it. But for me, it's more important for people to know I was a good father, a good husband, and I loved life and I loved my fans. That point that was exactly where I was just going to head to now. I was just going to say, fan wise, um, do you have any any words for the fans? Obviously. And not not in the past, but even the fans from the start through in the eye, just how they supported you. Yeah, you know, um, I was actually getting ready to write something on my blog because we're getting ready to put up a blog on my my dot com, so as I could be more in contact with the fans. But yeah. the one thing that I want fans to know is is that I came from a, 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 a broken childhood where I was living out on the street. I got stabbed. I was in placement at ten. Um, a lot of horrible things happening. Uh, I end up at Shamrock Boys' home. I, I was shown the right way to do things. I went to college, um, you know, got into some football and some, some different things. And the fans were great to me even in that sport. But then I got into pro wrestling and, and fighting. And, you know, when the fans had, had cheered and showed me um, that I mattered, that, that they loved what I did, and when they cheered for me, when I would come out from the back, or even if they booed, and most of the time they cheered, but at times they booed because I was from a different town or whatever. But it, it just gave me this thrill that, that I was able to entertain people, that I was able to give people joy from what I did. And to me, it will, it will never be forgotten. The fans are above the game. They are so much more important than anything in, in, in entertainment. They are the ones that matter. And uh, so for me, it's always wanting to make sure I give a shout out to the fans that supported me and the ones that actually came to watch. Um, you know, I love you guys. God bless. And it was it was a true honor to be able to entertain you 
for the past 30 years. Thank you. God bless. And obviously, just to say, to, to wrap everything up, you we mentioned uh, kenshamrock.com as your site, but are there any other ways that they can keep up to date with you, whether it's Twitter or how you're doing on, on any of the ministry stuff that you're doing or whatever? How can they keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, on, on, on my um, kenshamrock.com, I have my Twitter on there. I also have my Instagram, my Facebook, and also my emails. I also have a contact page on there, too, if somebody wants to bring me in for motivational speaking uh, or whether it's ministry work for churches. Um, I have a contact on there, and you can go on there and check it out. That's what I'm doing now. I also, uh, in, in, in the investment world, um, I speak the investment language. Um, I am uh, very much um, getting ready to go over into Vegas, and I have a partner of mine um, who has Grok Trading, which or Grok Trade, which is the, uh, one of my business partners. Yeah. Um, on November 15th through the 17th in Las Vegas, I'm going to be up there taking some classes, mentoring classes, and we're inviting people who are interested in the stock market trading or investments to come in and take those classes with me and let's have some fun and make money. This is my way to give back to the fans for supporting me throughout the years to be able to, um, you know, go side by side with them and be able to, um, you know, take these classes and, and be able to learn how they can invest the money that they already made and make more money on top of it. So um, it's a great it's a great opportunity. And I know a lot of people look when they talk about the stock market and trading all day, they, they they think of those movies where people are biting their fingernails and the numbers are going up and down and they're you're, they're squeezing their butt cheeks thinking they're gonna lose it all. But that's just not what we do. Uh, it's it's getting the right information, getting the news that you need, um, and the information from different sides, whether it's the news or, or whether it's the business itself. But grabbing numbers and, and putting them together and making sure that you're making sound investments and sound companies, and that way you can make money on it and you're not going to lose anything. So now that's what this class is about, um, teaching people uh, business language and being able to learn how to get the right information and be able to invest safely so if you're interested go on to my site kitchenwork.com check it out rock trade and uh, join us uh, November 15th through 17th in Las Vegas but um, that's kind of it but uh, we have one fun thing on my site which a lot of people have found pretty enjoyable there is an easter egg on our site it's you know it's hard to find <laughs> so, uh, if you find it there's a private page on there that uh, lets you on a page brings you into my life my personal life a lot of my family pictures, a lot of different things on there uh, that you'll have fun with. So if you find that Easter egg, man, uh, welcome aboard. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much um, for for giving me your time this afternoon. It's been genuinely fascinating from, from my point of view as well, getting to see or getting to know a bit more of the like the man behind the, the on-screen persona, if you know what I mean. So thank you so much. It's been really, really good. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, too. And again, don't forget, uh, I'm very, very much involved with my website, kitchenmarket.com. I'm also very involved with my Twitter and Facebook. So um, if you want to go on and check it out, send me a Twitter, an email, whatever, man. Um, I love my fans. I love being a part of them. You know, so join my family and uh, let's have some fun. God bless you all. <laughs>